Okay. So today I think really want to do is start with a question. And um, my question is, how do you see yourself? How do we see ourselves? The message that I put together this week in many ways has been shaped by three things. First is that clip from Sweden's Got Talent. Secondly, um, that Bible reading that Graham just read to us from 2 Corinthians 12. But also another song that I'm going to share with you a little bit later called The Truth Be Told. And I kind of hope in some ways that I started with these three things and I've tried to work through them in different ways. And I kind of hope that these three things that have, have in some ways influenced my message today fit together as we think about that question. How do we see ourselves? I wonder if you've ever felt in life not really enough, inadequate or of no real value. Sometimes I think these thoughts can pass through our minds and sometimes they can stay around and dominate us. A couple of examples of that might be parenting. We think, oh my, I'm just not enough, I can't know what I'm doing. Or maybe when we're trying to help somebody who has real needs and struggles and we're trying to help them but we feel limited and inadequate in what we can do for them. There's lots of areas, I think. But what about as a Christian? Do you ever feel that we're not good enough for God? That we've let God down? And this might cause us, I think, sometimes to give up on our faith or to try and earn his love rather than just accepting it and receiving it. I think when people feel like this, it can sometimes take us down paths of fear and shame and guilt and insecurity, low self-esteem perhaps, sadness, anxiety. It could rob us of our peace and our joy. And I've said before, we're not always very kind to ourselves, are we? So I want to think about those things a little bit. And the three things I want to share with you today, I kind of hope will just lift you a little bit. If that's at all something that you feel. The first thing I want to say to you is that we are all unique and have value. I used to work for the Salt Cellar Youth Project. I worked for it for 10 years. We used to go to lots of secondary schools and do, part of my work was going and doing RE. And we used to do a lesson on sanctity of life. We used to do a lesson about abortion and capital punishment and euthanasia. Uh, big, nice, easy topics to talk about with a lot of teenagers in school. It was a real challenging lesson. But we used to start the lesson with the price is right. Remember the price is right? But we never used to have objects like toasters and soda streams. We used to ask them, how much is a person worth? How much is a person worth? And we used to have this little bit of debate in the beginning and these different things. And then I used to read to them uh, this, that you know what, there's enough fat in a person, in an average person, this was a, a thing taken as an average person, so there's enough fat in a person for seven bars of soap. There's enough iron in an average person for one medium sized nail. There's enough sugar in an average person for about seven cups of tea. Enough lime for enough to whitewash one chicken house. There's enough phosphorus in an average person to tip 2,100 matches. There's enough magnesium for enough of one dose of salt, and there's enough sulphur uh, enough to get rid of one dog's worth of fleas. <laughs> Do you ever work all that? <laughs> but if you were to buy those things in a shop, it would cost you then, price of rises since, since I was in the salt of the but then £7.13p. Is that how much we're worth? <clears throat> yeah, we are so much more than that, aren't we? Yeah. We are God's creation. Yeah. Yeah. We are made in the image of God. Yeah. Our spirit, somehow, I understand, is in the image of God himself. Yeah. We're told in the Bible that we are the pinnacle, the best bit of all that God has made. We're all unique. You know, sometimes I watch programs like Barney Hunt. No, 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 not that. Only when I'm on my own, because if my family's there, they say, get that rubbish off. <laughs> but I look back. Now, sometimes you get those things in those soft programs. You know when they say, oh, this is like a limited edition. There's only been like 200 of these ever made. And that limited edition that's on it, if that's a word, makes it like even more valuable, doesn't it? There's only one of you and me. 
We're unique. We're unique. Our eyes and our fingerprint and our character and our personality. And I think this variety of uniqueness should enrich our world, though sometimes it does create division. <coughs> and here it is too. You know there are no mistakes in God's creation. Jeremiah 1 verse 5 says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, says the Lord. Before you were born, I set you apart. Ephesians 1 verses 4 and 5 says that he chose us, uh, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he presented us for adoption as son and daughters through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. Ephesians 2 verse 10, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. We are not mistakes. We are chosen and priceless and special. I used to tell a story about, um, meant to be a true story, about uh, some workmen on a, um, a work site, on a dig or whatever, a building site. And uh, as they were building, uh, one guy noticed something in the kind of the soil and he went down and he brushed it off. And it was a kind of a vase, it was an old vase. And he looked at it and he thought it was a bit battered and a bit, didn't look fantastic. And he was showing it to his mate. He said, look at this. What do you think? It doesn't look like much, does it? I'll just chuck it in the skip. And his mate said, no, wait a minute. Don't chuck it in the skip. Down the road, there's one of these archaeological digs. Just take it down there and see what they think. So after work, the guy got this old vase and he thought he was just going to chuck it in the skip. And he took it down to this ar ar archaeological, yeah, you know, old digging <laughs> site. <laughs> And, uh, and there was a guy then, he showed it to me, he said, I found this on my building site, just <coughs> what do you think? And the guy here he gave it to, his eyes just lit up. He was like, wow, that's an amazing find. Wow, that is so old, that is priceless to somebody like me. And I used to tell that story because I used to say, Who's, who, whose eyes do you see yourself through? So it was that same old bat of ours, it looked like that, to one guy, chuck it in the skip, to another guy, wow, it's amazing and priceless. <laughs> Whose eyes do you see yourself through? You see, God says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. <clears throat> That's how God sees us. Do you still need more evidence that you're valuable to God and that you're of great value? Well, this, he sent his only son to die for you. So that you can have a relationship with him now and that you can spend eternity with him in eternity. We all have great value. I want you to hear that today. The second thing I want to say is about taking the ordinary and making it spectacular. Because I think, if we're honest, most of us will probably say there is an ordinariness about most of us. <coughs> and this isn't really, and that's not meant to be a negative thing. Um, but in many ways, I think most of us would say we're a little bit like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. You know what I mean? And this is where God spoke to me when I first saw that clip. See, Twinkle Twinkle in that clip, it starts with something very simple, very ordinary, very familiar, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. <laughs> Yet put in the hands of this gifted musician, he begins to add in and he begins to embellish. And then what is produced is something quite spectacular. Something amazing and wonderful for those listening and looking on. You see what I might be saying here? See, when I watched that clip for the first time, I felt a little nudge in my spirit. And God says, that's a bit like you, David. Ordinary, simple, let's be honest. <laughs> a lad from Yorkshire who likes chips and football. <laughs> Can you relate to that ordinariness a little bit? But when... We put ourselves in God's hands, our gifted creator. When we do this, God begins to add in and he begins to embellish. How does he do this? Well, firstly, it's what God does for us. He forgives us, doesn't he? And then he starts the process in us of restoring us and healing us and setting us free. God's like the ultimate repair shop, isn't he? In our lives. What he starts to do for us when we put ourselves in his hands as our gifted creator. Secondly, it's what he puts in us. What does he put in us? He puts in us his love divine. 
which welcomes us, which affirms us, which assures us, which accepts us. And then he puts in us his Holy Spirit. Christ comes and lives in us. Galatians 2 verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Come on, that's a good thing, isn't it? God puts his power in us. Romans 1 verse 11, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you and me. When we put ourselves in God's hands, our gifted creator. And we become temples. We were talking about this at the beginning, weren't we, Ernest? 1 Corinthians 3 verse 16. Do you know that you yourself are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? You are a temple of God. The third thing he does is what God then does with us and through us as he's ordinary, simple, then embellished and added in, we become vessels for God. And he uses us, he can use us to help people and bless people, to bring hope and to lift the broken and to help people find something of Jesus in their own lives that they might be saved. As we put ourselves in his hands, we're able to, God is able to use us. It's the boy, isn't it, who had his little pat lunch and said to Jesus, well I've got this, and Jesus said, hey, hey, hey I can feed 5,000 people plus with this. Or it's about those fishermen who become world shakers and changers. It's about that guy who struggled with his speech and murdered somebody, but yet he leads the people of Israel out of slavery. Moses. It's about that little boy who has a few stones and a sling, but yet he defeats a giant. In God's hands, you see, he starts to put into us he starts to shape us, he starts to heal us and forgive us. Christ comes and lives in us. We become temples that he then can use in the world for his glory and for his kingdom. We might see ourselves a bit like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. But in the hands of the gifted creator, as he puts in and embellishes, we become spectacular. We're valuable in God's sight. My third thing, really, my third point is in our weakness, God is strong. And this takes me to our Bible reading today, our Bible reading from 1 Corinthians 12. You hear those words, grey and red for us. They're the words of the Apostle Paul, this great man of faith in the Bible. But in verse 7, if you caught it, he said this. Paul talks about a thorn in his flesh. What he does, what he's doing there, is expressing weakness in his life. We have this great man of God that people say, "Wow, we built the kingdom, started the church, all this," but he's expressing in this verse a weakness. He said, "I've got a thorn in my side, but we don't know what it is. <coughs> Was he battling with sin in some ways? Did he have some physical health problems?" Did he have some emotional struggles in his life? Was he, did he have some faith problems? Did he struggle with dryness in his faith? We just don't know. But we are told that he pleads with God to take it away. He says, God, I have weakness in my life. Take it away. But God, for some reason, and maybe we can think about why, allows it to stay in Paul's life. Because then we have these words in verses 9 and 10. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I think Paul sees that God is at work in his weakness. In fact, Paul says actually probably better that way. Why? Because Paul, I think, realises then it's less about him and it's more about his God. <coughs> See, in weakness we see more of our need of God. We look to him, you see. We cry out to him, don't we, in our weakness. In our weakness, we can discover God's provision. What does it say? His grace is sufficient. <coughs> there is power in our weakness. God's power, we are told, is made perfect in our weakness. There is even joy. Paul says, I delight 
in my weakness. And there is strength, for when I am weak, then I am strong in God, Paul says. God is glorified in our weakness. Paul says, I boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest in me. When I thought about those verses and I thought about what Paul was properly trying to say as he grasps, he grapples with his sense of, I'm, I have weakness in my life. And I thought to myself, who wonder who could relate to that in church today. That we have weakness, we might have weakness of sin or physical health, well-being or mental well-being, emotional well-being. It could be whatever. We, we can push into Paul and say, well actually God can do something here. Even in our weakness. That doesn't make us less valuable. It doesn't take us away from the, the sense of who we are in God. And it reminded me of that wristband that some Christians used to wear with the word frog on it. Do you remember that? <coughs> and it was this wristband that had the word F-R-O-G on it. Frog. It had a, and the frog meant, I think there was a challenge. It was a reminder to think of ourselves. And it used to stand for fully reliant I think that's what this reminded me, that even in our weakness, and maybe because of our weakness, we become fully reliant on God. If we've got it all sorted, we've got it all, you know, hey, I've got it, everything sort of going on. You know, if the country's blossoming, <laughs> and the world is roses, then we just say, who are you, God? But even in our weakness, we cry to him and say, I need you. But in that place we can say, God, even in my weakness, you are strong. Your grace is sufficient for me. And it takes me to the song. It's a song that I, I've listened to for a few weeks now. Some of you may know it, I don't know. It's called The Truth Be Told. It's by somebody called Matthew West and Carly Pierce. And it's a song that speaks about being honest in how we feel. Including how we feel when sometimes we feel we're not enough, inadequate. Or when we feel we have weakness in our lives. But it also then reminds us to bring them to our God. Let me pray to you the song. Play, pray. Play to you the song, the truth be told. <clears throat> Number one, you're supposed to have it all together And when they ask how you're doing Just smile and tell them never better Lie number two, everybody's life is perfect except yours So keep your messes and your wounds And your secrets safe with you behind closed doors Truth be told, the truth is rarely told. No, I say I'm fine, yeah, I'm fine, oh, I'm fine, hey, I'm fine, but I'm not. I'm broken, and when it's out of control, I say it's under control, but it's not. And you know it, I don't know why it's so hard to admit it. When being honest is the only way to fix it There's no failure, no fault, there's no sin you don't already know So let the truth be told There's a sign on the door, it says come as you are, but I doubt it if we lived like that was true Every Sunday morning pew would be crowded But didn't you say church should look more like a hospital A safe place for the sick The sinner and the scar and the prodigals Like me Well truth be told The truth is rarely told Oh, am I the only one who says I'm fine? Yeah, I'm fine. Oh, I'm fine. Hey, I'm fine, but I'm not. I'm broken. And when it's out of control, I say it's under 
control, but it's not, and you know it. I don't know why it's so hard to admit it, when being honest is the only way to fix it. There's no failure, no fall, there's no sin you don't already know. So let the truth be told. We've talked many times about just being honest before God, haven't we? And just saying that sometimes we, we put up that image, I'm fine, and it's all, all good, and that's the kind of the way, isn't it? But sometimes we just have to be honest. I mean, it starts there. Um, but sometimes we feel not enough. Sometimes we feel inadequate. Sometimes we know that we, we have weakness. But we need to take them to God. We need to know our value in God. That we have, have huge value in God as his creation. That mm. we need to put ourselves, I think, in God's hands and say, here we are, God. It might not seem much, it might seem ordinary, it might seem even broken. But in your hands, would you add in, would you embellish, would you would do something with me? And he will, because he does. Amazing things, actually. I used to pray about that in a minute, but I just want to sing again. And uh, I thought I'd, I'd chosen the song "No Longer a Slave to Fear" because it just reminds us that we're also one of the things that we all are is children of God, and that we are His children. And uh, so let's stand and let's proclaim that uh, together. Of the 